Ontario is open for business. The real estate market has gone crazy. He said, if you don't like it, move out. Labor costs and the price of construction materials have increased. Predominantly, our housing supply comes through some form of investment and profit seeking. More profit from every single unit that they own. There's no doubt that the cost of living associated with rent is becoming very serious indeed. We hear a lot of this when it comes to the rental market. We're going to continue building homes to make them affordable. Financial investment in housing. Crack down on rent evictions. Rent control. Purpose-built rentals. Purpose-built rentals. To get more affordable housing. Financialization. Zoning. Raise density. Politicians, advocates, and experts use them to explain the pain points Canadians are facing when it comes to housing, especially in its biggest city, Toronto. So, I spoke to a few people and they help make sense of why these terms matter so much right now. The real estate market has gone crazy. Housing affordability. Ensure that affordable housing gets built. Affordable housing. Housing affordability, it's the reason why we're making this video. What's affordable for you may be different than what's affordable for someone else. Economists and experts generally consider something affordable if it costs less than 30% of the household's before tax income. But the reality is people are spending more than that to put a roof over their head. This was a, a benchmark that was put into place decades ago as reasonable and affordable. But we've been so unreasonable, so unaffordable for so long that it is more realistic that people are, are trying to avoid spending half of their income on housing. And some are spending more than that just to be able to have a decent place to live. Let's look at Toronto with an average rent of just over $2,600 for a one bedroom unit. You need to earn $100,000 a year for that to be considered affordable. So affordability already feels out of reach for a lot of Torontonians. But here's the scary thing. It's expected to get even worse. In not so long, uh, seeing an average monthly rent of $3,000 a month. And, you know, after that, it's going to be, you know, $3,500 a month and then eventually $4,000 a month. And the question is, who can, who can afford these rents? Because um, the average household simply can't. So is a place to call home that you can actually afford gets harder and harder to find. Expect more and more people to be talking about this. Rent control. Rent control. Rent controls. There's no doubt that the cost of living associated with rent is becoming very serious indeed. No respect! No rent! No rent! Rent control. It's been a contentious debate for years. Advocates say it protects renters from huge increases. Developers say rent control makes it harder to build. The less money you can make from a rental building, the less likely you are to build. But some experts say we need rent control now more than ever. Rent control is absolutely critical right now. And don't forget the larger picture. If you've got less income, but your rent's going up and your food price is going up three times the pace of headline inflation, something's got to give. And so rent control becomes like a necessity to make sure we don't have more people that are basically evicted and or underhoused and hungry. Rent control does many things. It helps to it helps to provide a level of predictability in terms of what you know what you know what your rent is going to be. Rent control also ensures that we have better stability in our communities that we don't have folks that are constantly in flux where once the rent becomes unaffordable they're moving to another community. Here's the thing, this debate is more complicated than just rent control or no rent control. How it's applied makes a huge difference to renters. And most of the time, rent control isn't a blanket policy that applies to every building or tenant. For example, for years, rent control in Toronto only applied to buildings constructed before 1991. And right now, if you've lived in your unit since before November 2018, rent control applies to you. But if you move, your landlord can charge whatever they want for the unit. 
There's actually a term for this. It's called vacancy decontrol. Part of what I, I think vacancy decontrol does, it undermines uh, rent control because it gives you the it gives you the the impression or the illusion that it's rent control that's causing rents to go up. This concept is really important because there's a huge incentive for some landlords to pressure their tenants out. One of the ways that happens is rent eviction, kicking a tenant out to renovate an apartment and then putting it back on the market for much higher rent. So that's why you'll be hearing a lot about rent control, but expect specific policy to matter here. In the meantime, the lowest rents you'll find are likely in one of these. Purpose-built rentals. Purpose-built rental. Purpose-built rental apartments. Purpose-built rentals, it's just what it sounds like. A building where people rent units, often managed by a company, and that is different from a condo building where you rent from an individual owner. There are a few pros of living in purpose-built rentals. It's more secure than renting from a condo owner who can kick out a tenant to sell their unit or move in. Purpose-built rentals also tend to have less amenities and that makes rent a little bit cheaper. We used to build lots of dedicated rentals back in the 60s. The phenomenal increase in the number of apartment buildings but we actually haven't been building dedicated rental for the last 40 years. Most new rental units come from the condo market. Now, lots of people talk about building purpose-built rentals as a solution to beef up the rental supply for places like Toronto, but the reality is we're not building them fast enough. Constructing purpose-built rentals in Toronto seems to be a challenge compared to other Canadian cities. We're gonna see uh, a shortfall of like 170,000 units, and that's under a pretty optimistic scenario uh, for rental developments. It's pretty clear we need to do something to ramp up that level of construction and, and do it now. So building more is a big part of the conversation around rentals, but how we build is also part of the issue higher density, gentle density, medium or high density housing. So in housing terms, density is a measure of the number of units given in an area. It's the difference between taking one lot of land and building one single family home, a series of townhouses or a high rise building with a growing population in Toronto and only a finite amount of space. Some experts say we should be using existing land to build as many units as possible raise density targets, basically everywhere, particularly around transit, but basically in all central areas of the city. But you can't just build whatever you want, wherever you want. And that's because of a type of regulation called zoning. Zoning bylaws determine what you can build and where. Zoning is too restrictive. What we've seen over the last 40 years is more regulation. It's much more difficult to intensify when you're outside of certain areas of the city. Uh, to build apartment buildings. Some parcels of land are zoned only for single family homes, meaning even if a developer or property owner wanted to increase density, they legally could not. But in early 2023, Toronto City Council changed zoning laws to approve three and four unit multiplexes across the city. We think this is a step in the right direction, but obviously we know we need to go further. But not everyone is happy about zoning changes. Ever heard this term? NIMBY. It stands for not in my backyard. Turns out lots of people who live in single family lots don't want apartment buildings built next door. Now there's another piece to this rental puzzle and it has to do with how you think about housing fundamentally. Predominantly, our housing supply comes through some form of investment and profit seeking. Financialization. Financialization. That phenomenon where housing is increasingly thought of as a vehicle for building wealth is also called financialization. And it's one thing for individuals to invest in one or two rental properties, but there's something beyond that happening in Toronto. What's different about these types of entity is the scale. These entities are not acquiring, you know, one or two units. These entities are looking to acquire 200 to anywhere as north of five to 800 units in one transaction. These entities are looking to acquire units on mass 
And once they've bought them, some of these investors are looking to make as much money as they can off of these units. It is part of the business model because what they're trying to do is squeeze more profit from every single unit that they own. I mean, it's really quite incredible. They have projections of how much they can charge and how much they can increase the rents for every unit in every building. The, the challenge is that, you know, while we're trying to maintain affordability, a lot of these entities have a legal and fiduciary responsibilities to maximize the returns on their investment for their unit holders, investors, and shareholders. And as a result, they're not um, aligned with um, the strategies of maintaining affordability. I want to be clear, this isn't all of these big institutional investors. Some institutional investors might be better than others. Unfortunately, experts say the most vulnerable tenants are often targeted by these types of investors. These actors really hone in on affordable assets because that's where they will have the greatest um, margin for uh, profits. Who is it that lives in affordable housing? It tends to be low-income people, students, racialized communities, persons with disabilities, single parents, et cetera. But beyond investments and building wealth, there is another way to think about housing. We have a National Housing Strategy Act, and it says that the federal government's policy with respect to housing is that housing is a fundamental human right as understood in international law. The question that we should be asking is, well, what does that mean then? Why are we in the situation we're in? And doesn't that mean that governments should be engaging with both the private sector and other levels of government in a way that makes sure the human right to housing is realized? And are they doing that? One thing all the experts agree on and something you already know from just living life is that we're in the midst of a housing crisis and it's hitting almost everyone. From new Canadians arriving here in the country's biggest city having to sleep in the street or in church basements to a growing number of unhoused people, some calling city parks home, to middle income earners barely able to make rent every month, wondering if now is the time to give up on the city they love. At the same time, we know in Toronto, there is a flow of new people coming into the city. 700,000 more are expected by 2051. That's a lot, especially for a place already under pressure when it comes to housing for those who already call Toronto home. And with home and rental prices only going up, it feels like there's more pressure than ever to crack this enormous issue of affordability. Toronto used to build a lot of apartment buildings and this chart proves it. Hundreds of thousands of units were constructed between 1960 and 1979, but the number of new apartments began to slow down in the mid 70s and by the late 90s, that slow trickle came to a grinding halt. But here's what was being built, condos. At first, only a few, but then lots and lots and lots of them. So. Why did Toronto go from a powerhouse of new rental development to a sea of condominiums? And what does that mean for renters today? Toronto's golden era of apartment buildings was the 1960s. Demand was high thanks to baby boomers. Those babies are now 18, 19, 20. They're leaving the parents' home. And builders were getting extra encouragement from the government. So almost all rental housing built in Canada from 1945 to the end of the programs in 1984, actually, was subsidized. 
uh, lots of people don't realize that. We had a very, very favorable tax system uh, that gave significant um, uh, tax advantages to developers of rental housing. Um, and uh, so you basically had an industry that was keen to build, uh, people that were keen to, to you know, providing the demand. That combination of lots of demand plus government incentives meant that between 1960 and 1979, more than 220,000 rental units were built in the GTA. Plus, supply was also coming from social housing. Now, that's housing built for low-income renters with government funding. Eventually, over 300 low-cost homes will cover this area. And we were building the, uh, about 20,000 social housing units annually for three decades, 1965 to roughly 1995. So that was a lot of supply. So if you were a renter in the 1960s and 70s, things were good. But in the 80s and 90s, that started to change. In the mid 70s and early 80s, tax breaks for builders went away and so did those modest subsidies, all during a time when it was costing more to build. And because life was getting expensive for everyone, the federal government asked provinces to adopt rent control measures, which many of them did. So basically now you've suppressed the increase in rents at a time when costs are going up. So you kind of get this mismatch between the cost of building and the revenues you're going to generate in the long run, maybe downstream. Oh, and remember those baby boomers? They were getting older, starting families, and they wanted to trade apartment living for white picket fences. So you had a bit of weakening demand. So you had higher costs, unfavorable environment for taxes, and that was kind of the, the death knell in the, in the rental coffin. But while rental construction was slowing down, condos were picking up. Now there was a market of people who wanted to own apartments. The condo product, even though the legislation was created in 1969, it took a while for it to sort of be accepted in the marketplace and the idea of you know, buying an apartment versus buying a house, which people had traditionally been used to. So we really didn't sort of see uh, a significant growth in condominium construction really until the 1990s. Condo buildings took off and rental building trickled to a halt. But that switch, it didn't change much for renters, at least not right away. That's in part because in the 90s and early 2000s, lots of people were becoming homeowners. They were leaving the rental market, which made space for other renters to come in. We had this offsetting you know, release of pressure on the rental market by ability to access the home ownership market. And eventually, condos also started to feed into the rental market too, with more investors buying units and putting them up for rent. About 90% of new rental supply in the GTA comes from the condo sector. We've been kind of spoiled by the fact that we've had so much demand from investors buying condos and renting them out in the GTA that there wasn't really a whole lot of attention paid to the fact that we haven't been building purpose-built rentals in the GTA for, for, for really 40 or 50 years. Fast forward to today and Toronto is suddenly in dire need of more rental buildings. So I think what we really need is just a dramatic, drastic, substantial, huge increase in purpose-built rental being constructed. We're projecting rental demand in the GTA to increase by over 300,000 units in the next 10 years. It's pretty clear we need to do something to ramp up that level of construction and, and do it now. So why has that changed? Why does it all of a sudden feel like we need more rentals in Toronto? Well, for one, we stopped building social housing. In the late 80s, um, early 90s, both the federal and provincial levels of government got out of the housing business and we're this, you know, burden of uh, building and maintaining the existing stock really sort of fell on municipalities without any, you know, revenue tools to actually to do that. Also, owning a home is now completely out of reach for many. So in the past, where you would have a steady number of renters becoming homeowners, more of them are staying in the rental market. Now combine that with more people moving to Toronto and the need for rentals is at an all time high. Right now, for the foreseeable future, it's, it's a terrible moment. If you were to finish a sentence, 
for us. Renting in Toronto is... A nightmare. Yeah, a nightmare. So if Torontonians need rentals now more than ever, how come developers aren't jumping at the chance to capitalize on that demand? Well, that could be because right now the cost to build is too high. So you can address the problem on, on, the, on the cost side by trying to create housing that's, that's not as expensive, but it's impossible to, to build for less than what it costs to build. And therefore, you, you know, your minimum rents that you have to set have, have to cover the costs of operating the building, keeping the lights on, heating the units and paying the mortgage. So there is a, a, you know, a, a floor to which rents can actually come down. For private developers, it only makes sense to build if they can make their money back. And that means charging high rents. But what happens when most people just can't afford those rents? The supply and demand isn't operating properly. It hasn't operated on the rental side for many decades. The market responds to what? Market demand. Not just demand, right? It has to be people with enough money. We now have a society and a city with more and more households without enough money to generate what's called effective market demand. Effective market demand. That means enough people with enough money to justify building more housing. So if supply and demand is broken, what can fix the rental market? I think the writing has been on the wall for years, and then that is that the government needs to get back into the housing business, or the government needs to, you know, provide greater funding to nonprofit um, entities and community land trusts to where um, we're building more non-market housing. The government steps in when there's a market failure. We did that with our healthcare system. We sorted that one out so that people are not excluded from the healthcare system because of income. But we haven't done that for the housing system. We need public housing, affordable housing, because all of the building that we're talking about, most a lot of people can't afford it. Right here in this city, we have 90,000 households waiting for affordable housing on a subsidized housing list. Those are the kind of housing we really need desperately because for two decades we haven't built any public housing. We absolutely need to focus on rental, purpose-built rental housing that is affordable and the market will never build that. So the longer we wait for the market to deliver, the more of a crisis this is going to be. What happens to a city like Toronto when you take away rent control? Provincial government wiped out rent control. I'm faced to move. Where will I go? He said, if you don't like it, move out. In theory, regulating rent protects tenants from being priced out of their apartments. But one key argument against rent control is that it discourages new rentals from being built. Coupled with rent controls, it's not a very appealing picture. If developers don't think they can make enough money from a rental building, then they won't build it. If new rentals aren't being built, that's bad for renters. So what happens when rent control goes away? Do more rental buildings go up? Use a rent control exemption. Ontario's government did just that five years ago, but the results, they're not exactly what you'd expect. Ontario is open for business. Back in 2018, a newly elected provincial government wanted to give developers a reason to build rentals. So the Ford government rolled back some rent controls. If you lived in a unit, your rent was still protected, but any newly built units or newly converted units would have zero rent control regulations. At the time, the government said this would help create market-based incentives for supply growth, meaning developers could make more money from rentals and therefore would naturally want to build more of them. Taking away rent control was supposed to make all of that happen, and it worked, sort of. My name is Sean Hildebrand. I'm president of a company called Urbanation. We've been tracking the market for, for over four decades now. 
According to Urban Nation's research, when Ford took away rent control, the city saw a huge jump in proposed rental buildings. There's a large inventory of rental projects in the GTA that are proposed for development, meaning they have submitted an application. Developers applied to build more than 90,000 new rental units. Sounds like that could put a dent in Toronto's supply problem, right? But here's the thing, only one third of those applications actually got the green light. And for those that did get the go ahead to start building, construction isn't exactly easy right now. Building in Toronto is slow and expensive. And very few projects start construction over the last number of quarters. And this is due to high construction costs. It's due to labor shortages. It's due to uh, uh, approval delays and getting these projects shovel ready. And perhaps not surprisingly, higher interest rates means it costs more to build than it did a few years ago. Developers need to take out loans to build these uh, projects. So when rates rise, it hurts the economic viability of, of, of proceeding with development as well. So there's some very real negative uh, consequences. A report by the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation in 2021 found that costs associated with building, including everything from land to government charges, even underground parking, were just too high to make it worthwhile for many developers. And that's even without rent control in place. That report found that depending on the location and size, some rental buildings could still be profitable enough to attract developers. And it is true that in spite of all these challenges, more rental buildings are going up now than in the last 10 years. But don't expect it to solve Toronto's rental problems overnight. The staggering length of time it takes between when a purpose-built rental is proposed and then it actually being like ready to move into. Isn't Toronto one of the slowest cities in the world for getting it done? Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's 100 months between development application submission and, and, and actually having the project completed. Um, part of that is, is due to slow approvals. Part of that is due to the lengthy time it takes to build a, a, a rental building or a, a, any apartment building. 100 months to develop and build a rental building? That's more than eight years. The reality is that new builds won't be able to keep pace with the surging demand in Toronto. You know, we have seen a, you know, an increase in, in housing construction generally, about 40% increase from uh, pre-2019, both in Toronto and across the country. So the planning departments are, ex uh, are approving permits faster, the builders are building homes faster, um, but they're still not keeping up. We're, we're projecting rental demand in the GTA um, to increase by over 300,000 units in the next 10 years. If you look at the amount of supply uh, that could come online from purpose-built rentals and also condo rentals, we're going to see uh, a shortfall of like 170,000 units, and that's under a pretty optimistic scenario. And a new building years from now doesn't mean much to someone who needs an apartment today. We've made so much progress. After decades of stagnation, we're finally seeing the results of our plan. But as Canada and Ontario continues to grow at a record pace, we need to do more. We need to do more. Even Ontario's Premier admits it. We reached out to the province for further comment and in a statement, the Housing Ministry talked about substantial progress, adding the province is, quote, staying on track with around 11,000 rental starts, a 44% increase on the number of starts from the same period last year. This is the highest level of rental starts on record for this time of the year. So one policy change was never going to fix Toronto's entire housing crisis. And a lot of these issues come down to things that provincial policy just can't control, like a shortage of construction workers, inflation and interest rates going up. But there's been a lot of focus on this one thing, rent control. And it's worth asking, was that policy ever really holding back development? When Ford rolled back rent control, it really had only been in place for a year and a half. Even with decades of no rent control, rentals weren't getting built in Toronto, not on the scale the city needed. So for some, the benefits of rent control outweigh the potential negatives. So I think it's really important to keep rent controls firmly in everybody's 
line of sight that that is part of the issue. Making money isn't all there is. People need a place to live. What we do for one another through our governments has always been the way we make sure to provide for one another. And governments have got a bad rap at being able to do anything right, whether it's rent control or building, but it's like, nobody else is gonna do it for you. If we don't do it for ourselves through our governments, it's not gonna get done. So if you think this is a crisis, you know, change it. The argument I would put back to the developers is, well, you promised if we deregulate, you would build and you didn't. So we don't believe you when you say, uh, if we regulate, you'll stop. Um, because you weren't doing a lot of building in the first place, so it's not much to stop. And I think governments do need to, to think more seriously about rent control. happen if Toronto can't get these rent prices under control? It's a question I first thought about five years ago. My rent skyrocketed $950 a month. I thought there's no way. Back then, I remember thinking rent in Toronto was extremely expensive. This is the cheapest place I found in Toronto. I'm just having a hard time saving up for any kind of future in the city. Now it's way worse. The average monthly cost for a one bedroom apartment in September 2023 was more than $2,600. It's a perfect storm of factors leading rents to rise at an unprecedented speed. Not so far off in the distant future, he says, we could see rents of 3000 3500 eventually $4,000 a month. When I say soaring rents, things are changing very fast right now. This isn't, you know, a slow burn. The question is, who can afford that? The average household just can't. It got me thinking, what's going to happen to the city? What will it turn into? What will it look like? And perhaps most importantly, who will be left? We know rising rents are making it increasingly difficult for lots of people to keep a roof over their heads, but could skyrocketing rent be one of the reasons why we're seeing a shortage of workers in a number of industries? You bet. And it'll likely only get harder to recruit people to work in Toronto if they can't afford to live in Toronto. Key workers and essential workers, paramedics, police, fire, teachers, and nurses, if they can't afford to live in Toronto, the hospitals won't be able to staff in terms of both medical staff and support staff, the cleaners and the, the custodial staff and the, the orderlies that keep hospitals going. So there are effects right across the labor market and across the economy uh, that really do affect uh, the capacity of a city uh, to function. This was the problem in places like London, England and New York City, where, you know, people needed, employers needed to create um, key apartments where people could come and live in the apartment while they were working there and then go home on the weekends because they couldn't afford the time to commute. People won't move to the city if they can't live close to work. So how many hours a day are people willing to lose just to get to work and come back home? The most expensive houses and, and apartments are of course along the subway routes, but low income people don't live anywhere near the uh, subway routes. So that, that's the real cost is the uh, long commutes and extra expenses imposed on, on other people who can least uh, afford it. Moving further and further away, at what point do you just give up and move altogether? Turns out many people are already doing just that. We saw people leave the city during the pandemic when working from home became a thing. Well, life is maybe not fully back to normal, but close, we're still seeing an exodus from Toronto. A record number of people left Ontario in 2022. The top reasons, the soaring cost of living, stagnant wages, and low housing affordability. Certainly people struggling with housing. 
understand it on a kind of visceral level, right? Like, wait a second. Uh, I've done everything I'm supposed to do. I, I went to school. I even got a couple of gra- you know, graduate degrees. I have a pretty decent job and I still can't afford housing. Like, wait, the social contract is broken. That, that sort of pattern of migration out of Toronto, um, I think will, will, ex- will ex- expand and accelerate. People will say, we just simply can't afford to live in this city and they won't come. So there are a whole bunch of broad economic impacts uh, that I think that will put uh, Toronto on the edge of a cliff. As much as the city is about its neighborhood businesses and shops, to me, the heartbeat of Toronto is the culture, the arts and music scene. So what happens to that if rents keep rising? This is Oh. It's Nicole! My name is Aurora, Aurora Brown, and uh, most people these days know me from Baroness Von Sketch Show, which is a comedy sketch show that I helped create and star in on uh, CBC. I- I've been living in Toronto and performing here for a really long time. She's been making Canadians laugh for years, and she knows how hard it is for artists to find affordable housing, even at the best of times. She says she was lucky to find an apartment in this neighborhood at a pretty good rate. A lot of the people who worked in the building were artists of various kinds, um, musicians, photographers, um, makeup artists, uh, sketch comedians. That kind of stability of home, homing and rental units makes it possible for people to keep living in and enriching the city that they're part of. But in 2016, just as her show and professional life were taking off, out of nowhere, the landlord sold the building. The new owners handed out eviction notices to all the tenants. They eventually gutted the building before putting the units back on the market as luxury rentals. But Brown and another tenant did something not many people necessarily have the resources, time or energy to do. They fought back. We couldn't hurt them in in their business practices in any way. We couldn't stop them. I don't think they ever felt shame or anything like that. So any kind of comfort we did was cold comfort. Eventually, the tenants won a settlement. Brown and her family found a new apartment at a much higher rent in the same neighborhood. I know the rest of the country loves to hate on it, but I think if they lived where I live, they would have a really good time. It is a lovely place to live when you have a good neighborhood. And I've also been really fortunate to have, you know, had Baroness means I can pay rent. Um, but it's it's a grim situation out there for a lot of actors in particular. Like what happens to a place like Toronto mm-hmm. if we keep going down this path? Well, I mean, look at Yorkville, like, you know, in the 60s, Joni Mitchell, like that was like the place for artists and hippies. And now it's like the most expensive store. So I would imagine that's probably going to happen. I think you're going to either see people living in squalor in, you know, stacked on top of each other, or you just have people leave the city. And all the people who are coming in and buying houses in the cool places, I I guess it just won't be cool for very long unless they all start putting on sketch shows and Doing all that stuff? I don't know. Let's be honest, while many people are struggling right now, Toronto is also home to a lot of rich people. As affordability and the housing crisis gets worse, expect to see more polarization. 15 years from now, we have a whole part of the city that Uh, is full of people without very good life opportunities, earning very uh, little money. That's David Holchansky. He did a study on this very topic more than a decade ago, predicting exactly what we're seeing today. A city for the very rich and the very poor and a disappearing middle class. No one has a crystal ball, but much of what we've heard from the experts about Toronto's future just isn't good. And I'll be honest, at times it felt hopeless, but when I asked some of the smartest people who've been studying this issue, some of them for decades, is there hope? I was surprised by what I heard. And so long as people are angry or feel hopeless and want their governments to do something, something will happen because you need to keep the pressure up. Organize, if you're not organized, you're not gonna achieve something. So tenants are poorly organized, they they do their best, they're becoming more and more organized uh, with these rent strikes. I am, again, hopeful that that there's a younger generation out there 
who views housing as home and even maybe some young folks who want to get into the business of housing but aren't in it or don't want to be in it to make oodles of money who kind of recognize that maybe there's a way to do it in a more sustainable way in a more human rights friendly way so what will toronto look like if we can't get these rent prices under control who will be left probably lots of people we're a long way from seeing the city hollow out Toronto is a magnet and people won't stop coming here. So maybe it's more about how those people make it work. What kind of a life can you build here? Because if something doesn't change soon, we may continue to see a deepening divide where only some Torontonians are thriving and many others are just barely surviving.